Yeah. And in these situations, you kind of, you just try to block the scene a little bit. You can see the frame of it on the ground there. You can? The the, the shadow. Oh, that's where, where it ends. It's like, <laughs> don't even go notice it. Yeah. You just got to live with that stuff sometimes. Yeah. I think I have like a, a shadow of a 20 by in almost everything I've ever shot on them. <laughs> <laughs> I think because I wasn't working with a lot of money in the beginning, like I didn't have big sets to shoot, but I did really focus on close-ups a lot and making sure we always got like really solid performances. And I think the actors really felt like they were kind of cared for in that way. So I think that was sort of what my reputation sort of became, or, or it's what people picked up on from like the work I was putting on my reel. Cause kind of all I had was like a bunch of close-ups. We were talking about references a lot and talking about using color a lot, you know? And I'm always trying to squeeze in, like, taxi driver wherever I can. <laughs> I don't know why. It's just that every single time I'm on a project, like, oh, it's like a taxi driver one. <laughs> hey, everyone. How's it going? Welcome back to The Moving Image. After a brief hiatus, we are back with episode three. My name is Poncho Navarro, and we are keeping the ball rolling. We're making it happen. Today, we have a great interview with Maya Bankovic, CSC. She's an amazing cinematographer. You may know some of her work from things like Working Moms, um, Mayor of Kingstown, and most recently, she finished shooting for Star Trek Discovery, which is pretty cool. And she has won a couple of Canadian Screen Awards. She has won it twice. She's been nominated a bunch of times. And today, we are talking about a film that she won it with back in 2021, and it's a film called Aquila's Escape which is an action film. It's very poetic. It's it's great. We're going to break it down. We're going to show some clips. And we're also t talking about another film of hers called Easy Land, uh, starring Nina Kiri. And that's a mother and daughter tale. It's an immigrant story. It's a coming of age. I don't know. I connected with that film in a deep level. I really, like, really loved it. So I hope you did too. And I'm really happy to have had this conversation because Maya is amazing. And yeah, I'm just grateful to have had this privilege. So without further ado, Maya Bankovic, CSC. Thank you so much for, for being here. Thank you. Thanks. It's a pleasure. It's going to be fun. Awesome. I'm just going to point this mic towards you a little bit. Hello, hello. All right. Cool. So I would love to hear the story of your path from when you decided to go into film to the moment where you actually felt that you were officially a cinematographer hmm. and you could say that. Yeah, that's cool. Um, I guess I didn't really know what the different delineations were in the different roles and things like that when I was watching movies as a kid and absorbing all of it. I definitely paid attention to the credits, though, and I saw there was something called a cinematographer, a director of photography. So by the time I was in high school, I really loved um, like photography, darkroom photography, and like the technical aspect. But um, it seemed like a little bit of like a lonely life, you know, to just pursue still photography. So I thought about like different ways I could keep working with people and collaborating with people. And I'm also not really much of a writer. So in terms of coming up with concepts and things like that, I, I really liked working with, you know, just my friends and stuff who would cook up ideas and then I could be behind the camera and make stuff um, that way with them and uh, come up with like visual storytelling ideas that would then like, kind of heighten the story. And I realized like that is a job. That's what we do. So um, so then I went to film school in Toronto. Uh, I did a four year program um, at York University And uh, I, I really focused on shooting people's films, you know, so um, I think I, I think I shot like I way overshot what I needed to for the for the degree requirements. But there were a lot of fun ideas floating around and a lot of fun ways to experiment. So um, experimenting with cameras was always like part of the joy for sure. Um, and like the optics and stuff like that with storytelling. And so I was just trying to find short films and ways to keep doing that afterward. And um a lot of that was through the friends I made at school and we would kind of get a little, little bit of money together or, uh, you know, kind of cobble together a small equipment package. And, um, you know, in those early years, there's not a lot of focus on lighting because you kind of can't afford lighting. So so I think it was what it enabled me to do was just really figure out ways of using the camera to tell the stories visually, to capture performances, stuff like that, you know, without the lighting component so much. Um, and a lot of that was like documentary work as well. And how to just like exist in a space or exist in a scene and capture it um, in a documentary setting. So that was like a way to um, just keep earning a living with cinematography without, you know, um, really having um, a lot of opportunities on the narrative side yet. But um, 
that was always sort of something I was working on meanwhile, you know, like to keep find, trying to find scripts to shoot and stuff. So I guess you could say things just kind of snowballed from there and the and the body of work kind of built up from there and, the, you know, the community or the uh, the network kind of picked up from just doing those small projects. Right. Yeah. So you, you kind of started into documentary more. And then yeah. how did the uh, narrative work com came came to be? Um, so it was always sort of on the on the side because those maybe you know for every five documentaries there'd be a narrative short film let's say or and eventually a feature that someone was like self financing and that kind of thing, but um, but definitely um, this thing about like just knowing how important capturing performances were to directors I think really helped to get my name around as like a, a cinematographer who's like who who focuses on performance a lot um which then became very attractive to um like fiction directors because that that is really you know at the heart of what usually of what they're trying to do um in like the dramatic narrative world I would say mm -hmm. and um to really do those performances justice that way so I think because I didn't have wasn't working with a lot of money even in doc or scripted in the beginning like um I didn't have big sets to shoot and I didn't have a lot of camera movement, but I did really focus on close-ups a lot and making sure we always got like really great um, close-ups and really solid performances. And I think the actors really felt like they were being um, kind of cared for in that way. Yeah. So I think that was sort of what my um, reputation sort of became or, or it's what people picked up on from like the work I was putting on my reel because kind of all I had was like a bunch of close-ups. <laughs> <laughs> So, but that that kind of served me well in a way because like the directors who really, really care about that ended up gravitating toward it because it wasn't like a reel of like a lot of flashy stuff or like really big scope, but it had um, emphasis on their actors, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very more, like more emotional. Yeah. More portraying that emotion of the, the performances. Yeah. Exactly. And how did you manage to to hone that skill of, of lighting? Yeah, so definitely like having to make the shift of going from like small contained sets and frames, such as the close up, to lighting for bigger and lighting for continuity on top of mood and everything was like a, I think that was like a big step. I had to sort of learn from uh, people who had done it a lot more at that point. Um, but the ball was already rolling, so I wasn't really, yeah, in a position where I was going to turn down shooting jobs in order to go work as an electric for a while. So I kind of had to learn from gaffers and and the key grips who would offer really great suggestions on how to go bigger with the lighting you know like basically doubling the size of the light I asked for yeah. <laughs> and I picked up on that they were doing that um because I hadn't had access to stuff like um like 4ks and stuff before you know so I was used to smaller lights closer you know but for them it makes their life a lot easier just to have a big to have a big light and bring it down yeah. so I learned that really quickly because I was like okay whatever makes your life easier That's what we should do. And I was like noticing that they were kind of doubling the wattage of what I thought we were going to do um, because we started having access to that stuff. So um, so that's kind of like how I kind of learned how to um, really embrace lighting sets now, you know, yeah. to go from lighting frames and moments and what we can basically afford to light um, or dress and then really thinking about the bigger world beyond that and, uh, and then how to, you know... Um, block within something much bigger a bigger stage now so, yeah super interesting yeah. i think a lot of people maybe get caught up in the lighting aspect of it but mm -hmm. then they fall short on framing and like actually saying something with your frame right yeah 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 and there's so much we could do with optics and focal length choices and stuff so i think it's actually, it's actually kind of really cool to have limits like that yeah at any point at any point in your yeah, career it enhances creativity yeah a lot. Mm -hmm. cool Did, by at any point in your career uh would you consider that you had a a mentor or someone that kind of guided you or, or taught you something really, like that you value today? Um, I kind of picked up information along the way from people. Uh, I don't know, maybe I, I think I was a bit too shy for that, to be honest. I didn't really have like one person I was going to to like give me feedback or um, maybe I just didn't have like a stomach for it or something. But like definitely like a, a prof of mine from York University, he stayed, we stayed in touch for many years. We're still in touch. Um, and that's Antonin Lotsky, also CSC. Yes. Um, so And he would sort of like kind of help me get started with some of my early jobs and stuff or he would like kind of pass jobs off to me. But like I didn't really like seek out um, critiques or something like that. Like maybe I should have. But I actually relied on my directors a lot for that kind of thing. Right. Because they're the ones that I feel like I have to please the most. They have to be the happiest with it. So I learned from them a lot about 
you know, movies or things I haven't seen yet before or art or, you know, what music's inspiring them. Like they have, they have taught me a lot along the way. That's why I think it's really important to choose my directors very wisely because yeah. um, they end up, yeah, they teach me a lot. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. And now you talk about movies and art. What kind of movies do you gravitate towards? So like what kind of movies move you? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> or I, art in general, like it could yeah, be music or paintings. Or yeah, what? yeah, true. Um, well, film and TV, like I've always really loved um, just like quiet family dramas, especially like multi-generational stories. Same with books. Like they just tend to, I just tend to gravitate towards like these sweeping, like kind of multi-generational tales or like, you know, things that like kind of small stories or, but, but that kind of have high stakes for the individuals, you know? Yeah. So um, that's just sort of what I've always been um, drawn to, but But I, but then there's another part of me that loves like satire very, very much, you know. And I think that's like the still photography thing because there's such a, f a fun way to shoot like a very layered image with like humor in it. That's yeah. also smart, you know. Um, like a latest example is like um, Triangle of Sadness or like, yeah. Oh you know? my god, I love that movie. I, yeah. I've heard a lot of different opinions on it, on it but mm -hmm. <laughs> I couldn't stop laughing. I know it's it's just like amazing. Like I don't know. So I, I just I love that type of like absurdist yeah. cinematography. Really, like it, it could only be a film. Well, maybe no. It could probably be a pretty good play. But there's so much about it that's like so visual and layers. Yeah, and how it progressively gets crazier and crazier. Yeah, and crazier. exactly. It's, it's amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. So yeah. Um, Would you say there's a there was a project in, in specific where you actually finally said, okay, I am a cinematographer officially. I can say mm. I, I can call myself that. Um, hmm. Yeah, probably. You know, I think it was when I started getting hired from the by the National Film Board to do stuff because it felt like very legit, and I grew up watching that stuff. Like in Canada, we watched these. They, they even played in like the public schools these like VHS tapes with like short films on loop of like you know different of, of all kinds of different genres and styles and everything and it to me was like the the really like kind of official way to be like a film artist in Canada or something so like once I started kind of getting in with them I was like oh okay cool like they trust me to like contribute something to this catalog of of stuff and like you know It was playing in the high, the stuff that I was shooting was in high schools and stuff too, just like how I watched stuff. So it kind of felt like a link in the chain a bit, you know? Nice. Yeah. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I'm going to get a little more technical, mm -hmm. if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, When it comes to w when you're prepping a project, do you normally go with the, uh, do you have like a go-to crew or do you like working with mm. new people? So it's like, it's such a boring answer, but it's like, it, I have like a pretty wide um, array of like favorite collaborators, but it also, it depends on so many things. Like, first of all, we have like two unions in Toronto and, or in this part of Canada. So it's like, depending on what kind of production it is, it's like, who, um, who can I work with on this or yeah. not? So there's like different camps for when it comes to like um, the gaffer and stuff. Um, and then I, I think a lot about like the director and their sensibility and their kind of like vibe and who they would get along with as an operator. Because I think that camera operators, if it's not me operating, it's really like an extension of the director, just yeah. like how we all should be, you know, but, but with them, like, I'm totally fine with the director going and talking to the operator about coverage and stuff. And I'm focusing on lighting and stuff because we've already collectively come up with a language and stuff like that together so it's it, it you know some people really don't like that they really want to be the only one talking to their crew and stuff yeah. but like i just feel like we're all kind of in it together so it's really important to me to, that i'm matching kind of matchmaking properly there um so but like you know the operators i work with they're really really lovely people who can almost work with anybody i would say but sure. um and then it's like does it the project need steady cam or not or you know just yeah, what are their personal interests yeah department yeah. and who might like gravitate toward the material more and stuff like that sure. too so i guess it's not so. a matter of people you know or people you don't know it's i guess the matter of like being the right people for the job yeah exactly like or if i'm doing a a job um in in a city that's not my own and then i have to kind of trust word of mouth from the local producers and stuff and like do you know some meetings and stuff and just r figure out how to like read the person because um You know, everything's different when you're under the pressure of a of a shoot day. But I, I feel like I've gotten pretty good at, at reading, like, you know, if someone's got the right vibe or not. But, you know, there's always surprises. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. And um, when it comes to gear, mm -hmm. do you have like a go-to package, lighting package or camera package that you like to gravitate towards? Or 
Or how do you um, root that? Yeah, for lighting. Um, there are certain things that are just must-haves for me these days. Like I won't work without like Helios and Titans okay. <laughs> and um, sky panels or celebs. I'm actually okay with either. Um, but uh, like it's just a lot of LED for me these days unless I need more throw and, mm -hmm. you know, so so there's certain like base things. And then from there, I would say it's like, do we need something even smaller or something even bigger? And that becomes specialty items. I also really like, um, sorry, my phone's going up. I also really like um, um, like LED lusters, like Source 4s that are LED, mm. because of um, I just think you can like kind of fake a source really well with them and yeah. kind of hide them or bounce them and play with the color, or like match a window light. If you can't get a light outside, you can kind of do some fake splashes on the wall with it that's like kind of fun and theatrical sometimes. Yeah. So I like to have one of those on hand. That's cool. Yeah. And in terms of camera and lenses, stuff like oh, that? Oh, yeah. I used to have a go-to, which was always like, uh, you know, whatever iteration of the Alexa at the time, and yeah. then um, Cook uh, S4s, because mm -hmm. I just like really trusted those on faces, because again, it's all about the faces. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I really like the way they run, and I still do, but then um, once I got into commercial cinematography, I really like expanded the palette more, because every commercial is like a different opportunity to like, try out a set that you don't have to like commit to for a whole film, you know, you yeah. could just do, yeah, like a 30 second spot on um Vintage cooks, for example, or Kawa, or like, you know, or like anamorphics that you haven't tried yet and stuff. So, um, yeah, I've expanded beyond that. But for many years, it was, I should have actually like probably bought a, a set of them now that I know how that works. That's like a crazy <laughs> racket, but I don't necessarily recommend to people to go get into the lens buying racket, but it's <laughs> like, <laughs> if you do have a preferred set. That's yeah. cool. All right. Um, I guess we can maybe jump in the breakdown. Okay. Watch a couple of, of the clips that I that I gathered from from a couple of films of yours. Mm -hmm. That was Aquila's Escape and Easy Land. Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, Those I, are both shot on with cooks. That's funny. See? Some <laughs> things never change. Let's talk about Easy Land first. Sure. Um I'd love to know how'd you end up there? Like how, mm. how did you end up being the DP yeah, for that? That's like that was a, a project that like um I didn't think I could squeeze it in because I was just finishing a season of a show called Working Moms and mm -hmm. it was, I, I barely had time to prep it and I warned them like, I was like, I don't know if this is going to be the right thing for you because I think I have like two weeks and then you want to shoot it. Um, but the director, Sanya Zhivkovich, she was like really committed to doing a lot of her own like heavy lifting on the prep and just bring me into like fill in sort of because she knew that it was going to be a lot of like at the end of the day, like very instinct, instinct driven camera work, you yeah. know, so as long as we're familiar with the strategy and the spaces that like the film would, we would figure it out as we went along. Cause as you'll see, it's pretty raw, you know? Um, and it was like a very low budget. It was like a, a grant that's meant to support first time fil uh, feature filmmakers. Mm -hmm. So it was arts council, right? It was actually the telefilm <clears throat> talent okay. to watch. And then, um, and, but it was, the, yeah, I just like really believed in her, you know, like she, she's so incredibly smart and she's such a good director to actors. Like that to me is like really, really important because we can do our job as well or as not good at all as, as the whole range of cinematography is. But if a director is good with actors, like there's something there, yeah, you know, yeah. and it was a good script and I, it actually did speak to me thematically too like the, the the topic of mental health was very important to me yeah. and it still is but at the time especially and um and also it's like my native language of serbian so it was kind of cool to like work with actors speaking you know like the language i grew up listening to so i could be in on all of that with them and listen to the direction with the crew was like in the dark but i as an operator i could like you know yeah. uh, understand mm -hmm. what they were doing next and react to them in a way that was like dialogue driven so that was pretty unique because it's pretty obscure country absolutely yeah, yeah and, <laughs> i don't know I, I found it very beautiful like it's very layered i mean it's a it's a it's a mother and daughter tale it's mm -hmm. a coming of age it's a, an immigrant story mm -hmm. like it has a lot of a lot of different elements and like i don't know i mm -hmm. was i was very moved by it and i really liked oh the, thank you I, I really loved the work that you did on it oh thank you so thank you. um yeah let's watch a couple of uh yeah of shots i i'm really interested in your take on exterior days because mm -hmm. those are a big challenge Always. Yeah. Universe sucks. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I, 
I don't want to intrude or anything, but I personally, I, I would never recommend. Well, thanks for clearing that up. Um, I, um, I specialize in um, complex building structures. So, I don't know, maybe if I can help. Where's that beautiful accent from? Serbia. Thank you. Yeah, this one you can, this is like our one 20 by 20 silk, like, you know, hiding somewhere. And I still wish we had, could have done it differently, but, you know, you just can't sometimes. Just calm it down a little, maybe add a net to the silk or something. <laughs> but, yeah, you just kind of have to um, embrace sometimes. But it gave, this one actually gave the actors, like, really not a lot of room to to work in. And they, everyone kind of has to be on board with that because it's just like there's a frame and it's like you're good within this square. Right. Please make it work. But um, did you we have had to, work to embrace around, that with the style. So Yeah. Did you have to work around a certain time of day? Did you? For most of the film we did, yeah. We had to schedule it like, you know, true night for night, day for day. Right. Especially the interior of the apartment building, which was like a, I think, 19th story and like no control other yeah. than like window dressing. So um, that was all about creative scheduling, as a lot of things are even at the higher level, you know, like... There's always a schedule. The schedule is still the thing that's <laughs> dictating so much. So it's like if you can work creatively with the AD to make that work. For sure. So you know. here, pretty much you only had the sun and the, and the and silk. And the silk, yeah. It was like a full silk. And you know, that, and 20? that's really, yeah, 20 by just, just really just to make sure we got her eyes, you know. Like sometimes it's just about like Yeah, so she that. wasn't like squinting so yeah, hard. Yeah, exactly. And I guess it's only on her, right? Because he looks pretty... Yeah, and then we kind of let it go. And he got he had a bounce. I remember there was like our key grip was following him with a bounce. Right. Yeah. So the bounce was on like this side of the sun or were you like rubbing it I think more? I think, that, yeah, they would have been not to my left. Okay. Just right in there to try to like scoop something into the eyes a bit. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, and yeah. in these situations, you kind of, you just try to block the scene a little bit. You can see the frame of it on the ground there. You can? The The, the shadow. Oh, that's where, where it ends. I like, <laughs> didn't even go notice it. Yeah, you just gotta live with that stuff sometimes. Yeah, I think I have like a, a shadow of a twenty by in almost everything I've ever shot on them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sometimes yeah, you just try to hide it in the architecture or something, right? Yeah, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, but it's 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 awesome. I mean, I really like. Yeah, what you and it's there. just it is just what it is, yeah, you know. Sometimes it's like really simple, and it comes down to like scheduling. But yeah, thank but, you. Yeah. Come here. No, leave your things. Okay, everyone, slowly find yourselves. And let's do an uh, improv warm-up with our newest member. I told you I didn't want to be an actor. Oh, it doesn't matter. Everyone on the team participates. I'll turn off my phone. Not about your phone. It's about how I run the troop. This is, I think, my favorite set. And like how you work the light in this one. Because, mm. and it's also like what drives her to, you know, her yeah. art, right? Like her, yeah. she finds her thing and she she grows in that in that aspect. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it just took me through through yeah. the, the theater set. So we, yeah, we installed a bunch of park hands in the back. So like, you know, like one case. Do you want me to draw it? Yeah, that'd be great. This was a few years ago now, but it was very simple. Um, so if this was the stage... We had some rows here of, of seating. And then there up top here, there would have been like a bunch of par cans. Just like 1K, you know? Mm -hmm. And then whenever possible, we wanted them like um, backlighting so that the the feeling of being on stage should feel, you know, kind of special Yeah, for her. For, yeah, as you said, for her arc. Exactly. So for, for, I guess on this part, when she's sitting in the audience and all that stuff, the light's coming from... The actual stage. Yeah, but it's not actually because that we that's very cheated because there was like zero throw off these coming back the other way. Yeah. So that that's that's her. That's Nina. That's how I draw. I always draw where the nose is, and the uh -huh. shoulders. So <laughs> <laughs> and then so uh, we would have had like a, um, I think it was just like an S sixty here, with like a bag as we say, with like probably magic cloth on there. Oh. A few a few meters probably away, you know. Um, very very soft, just to 
act as if it's like the bounce coming back for any of the stuff of them watching. Right. So all of you, and you don't even notice it when you're just immersed in the story, but like when I was like uh, actually analyzing it, mm -hmm. it's it's. I mean, you have the soft light coming from the stage yeah. direction, from like this direction. Yeah. And then when she gets on the stage, mm -hmm. then you get all. Yeah, I see those parts. Yeah, then it's all backlit and it's supposed to feel, you know, yeah, no, it, heightened. But exactly. but like, look at him. Like, it's never, it's never quite as or where her coat is. It's never quite as much throw as you think coming yeah. back off the stage. So, we did a bit of cheaty business there. No, but it it, it works pretty. I mean, it works perfectly for this, for Thank this because it's you don't notice the I guess the continuity of the sight of where the light comes from. Yeah, because you're so immersed in like her world mm -hmm. she's but a great it, actor too yeah no she, she's amazing yeah nina that, that's her name's nina right yeah so, nina kiri uh, mm -hmm. yeah. and yeah in retrospect maybe i would have lost the filters we had some filters in the camera for um for the whole film it was mm. it was very subtle like a quarter black diffusion effects okay which was like my go-to at the time but uh maybe this would have i'm thinking like maybe just like clean would have been good but you know those those are those things you just do them and then maybe you're kind of it's like a phase yeah and then you're And then you go back to the no filter look for a while, and then you go full <laughs> glimmer glass again. It's just all phases. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, you outgrow yeah. your taste, and that's good. It's like progress, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's awesome. I really like that. Oh, thank you. And it's a warmer world here too, because her um, world with her mom was quite dreary and yeah, yeah pretty bleak. Yeah, and the apartment is a like a. It must have been like a real challenge. Because it seems like tight spaces and like blank yeah. walls and all that stuff. Yeah, you know, you just you just want something to look at, and so but but it's it, it really helps when everyone's on board with the process of how you kind of have to do it, or you're or sometimes it's you want to. Like I actually don't think a film like this would have been good to do with the whole circus of like everything and the full yeah. crew and everything. But but to some extent, it was a necessity. Um, but you know, when everyone's on board with that and they're dressing to what looks good, and the director especially is on board with it and like really embracing the the um kind of grittier texture and everything like that then that's yeah and back to what, what you were saying about night for night and day for day yeah i have two clips of like the apartment during the night yeah. and the apartment during the day start everything from scratch that's why we need this it, it's it's to help exactly thank you oh it's to make a transition and besides all beautiful gardens and it's a little spa this shot here i think we actually shot before it was dark because we just decided to exclude the big windows and so we were able to black everything from the inside okay just to get the master done right. and then anytime we had to see the windows we just scheduled that for like last Later, kind of yeah. yeah so that's that's all practicals right yeah uh no actually i think sorry there so if you look there's like there is a source on the left there The you can kind of tell where the shadows are going. We would have like... Yeah, like that way. Yeah, I think it would have been like a celeb with a grid, you know, like okay. just for her. Because practicals never do as much as I want them to yeah, do. Everyone sure. says that we're going to shoot only practicals. And it's like, <laughs> I always yeah. want a little more on the face, you know. So, hallway. And this is the couch with mom. There's Nina and practicals. So there would have been a celeb here, I believe. Little okay. one, you know, just to, and then probably I, I, it's, I always box them in with ciders. Right. Yeah. So that this would have been coming in at her this way. Nice. Yeah. She's kind of getting it there. Yeah. On Gets her shoulder. That, yeah. Mm -hmm. Probably another one on top to keep it off all that. Of the ceiling, right? Yeah. And I think we didn't have, and then of course you just move the stuff around the room, right? Like that's yeah. just how and you just dance it around. And how about these close ups? The close up, I, I believe. I think we didn't have Titan tubes on this on this film, but you know what, what seems like something I would do is just take that lampshade off, honestly, probably, and okay. just and just like put a just to get more out of it. So these their faces are lit by the practicals. Yeah, I think in this case. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, because I remember they're, they're, you know it's all handheld and we want to kind of give them room. I'm yeah. pretty sure at this point what we would have done is like yeah, just squeeze these in behind for that shot and then. To probably, t I think I remember taking the lampshade off this one and maybe put a little like open ended uh, opal or something there. Right. Yeah. Because you can see, I mean, the, her eyelid is like very small, right? Yeah. So yeah. It makes sense. It could have just been a bare bulb, like a diffused bare bulb yeah. or something. Just take off the heavy shade. That's awesome. I mean, just simple stuff. Yeah. But this but was still. extremely simple, this movie. But it's a good, it's a good thing to do. I think it's a fun experiment for anyone. To just try to do a whole movie like yeah. that. Yeah, no, no, it's it's it is very inspirational for me actually because people 
do this kind of stuff. Yeah, and it's, they just do. No excuse. It's like, uh, yeah, exactly. And also, like, even when you have all the the stuff, sometimes you just like don't need it. There's certain scenes that you can like feel comfortable doing that. You know, even yeah. if you have more gear. For sure. Yeah. Uh, I'm guessing that's just natural light and some diffusion through the windows or mm -hmm. playing with the shears for texture? I think just the shears probably. Yeah, because sometimes you put up a whole silk and it just goes everywhere, right? It just kind of... Yeah. yeah, and this is like, I don't know, kind of also embracing the, the front light, which can look very pretty on people. But also it's bare walls but it's it's a story point you know because yeah. she she used to have all these plans up on the walls that was no, part of so her cool. yeah her like kind of looming mania but it's all gone so sometimes it's a good thing you know to just uh do the whole like light of day thing do you have any neg there at all, at all or? yeah i think so i think probably some floppies on this side yeah, but even the window light thing, normally I like to like creep something else around a little bit, like right behind, like, you know, probably almost beside the window so that it carries it over. It kind of yeah, continues like the wrap. It up. Yeah. That's really cool. I really love this movie. Thank you. I mean, I'm glad it spoke to you. I, th I think it, it it can reach people for unexpected reasons, this yeah. one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I really buy them as a mother daughter, mother too. They're yeah. just such good actors, <laughs> both of them. But it's so cool. Like the casting came together like in, with the language I guess that, that must have been yeah. a challenge for uh, Mirjana who plays the mom she's like uh, something of a legend for former Yugoslavia you know she's been living in LA for decades now and she's actually a professor too and stuff so that was someone the director like she really like kind of went after and like you know she Mirjana's amazing she's like I, I just couldn't get the character out of my head and, you know I just like I was like I think I have to do this movie so she's a very passionate actor and uh took time out of her own schedule, you know, to, and she's just like, let's just make it work. Let's do it. So that's awesome. Mm -hmm. All right. And, uh, I guess for this, you, you said you only had two weeks to prep. for this Yeah. Movie. Yeah. And a lot of that was just trying to find that location together. Right. And what'll work. What kind of crew did you have here? Um, it was actually just like my gaffer Blaine badge. Key grip was Chris LeBlanc. And then we had, um, we had Brad Usher helping Chris LeBlanc and kind of almost just swinging. It was mm. really small. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, focus puller was uh, Gabriella Osio Vanden, who's a, a, a great uh, DP, actually. Uh, and she, she just came out for fun. I don't know. Like, I mean, like it was a job, but you know what I mean? Like yeah, she yeah, was yeah, already doing her own shooting and stuff, but it was great because she has such good instincts too. And it was all kind of improvised yeah. blocking and focus pulling and everything. So <laughs> it was a very tiny. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Let's jump to Aquila's Escape. Yeah. What's the, what's the backstory behind that one? Yeah, this one, the, the director, Charles Officer, and I, we know each other from the documentary world. Mm -hmm. So we'd done a little bit of shooting with um, a Black Lives Matter group for part of another doc he did in Toronto when his, the, the, the DP from that... Um, project i don't know i just basically filled in for him for a few days for like this one scene but charles and i knew each other from like events and stuff and like socially so um i don't know he he was contacting me about this this film but he had been uh working on it for like almost 10 years wow so it was really cool like that it's just sort of yeah it was something he he thought i could do it well he had seen some other stuff where i guess there is a little bit of that um yeah, like, I don't know. There, there, he wanted a lot of poetry behind it. He didn't want it just, like, shot like a slick gangster movie or something. Yeah. He wanted something that had a little bit more emotion to it beyond all that stuff that's just in the script. There's, like, guns and there's all this stuff in the script, but he didn't want it to be, like, a gangster yeah. movie. Like you know a, what I mean? Like a poetic action movie. Yeah, it's like a poetic action movie. <laughs> that's cool. So, and he told me he just wanted to have that kind of, like, I don't know, like a human maybe touch to it or something that he'd seen in, in some of the stuff. So, um that was like a big honor to know he'd been working on it for so long and yeah, it's just like stars aligned with our schedules and stuff. So then we were talking about references a lot and talking about using color a lot, you know, um, and I'm always trying to squeeze in like taxi driver wherever I can. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> it's just every single time I want to part, I was like, oh, it's like a taxi driver one. <laughs> so then we were thinking, you know, maybe those amber colors would be cool and giving it sort of like almost like a 70s edge or something to it, but a modern, like contemporary um, crime noir, basically is what we were calling it. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> cool. And um, 
how did the visualization process uh, work? Or how, mm. how do you do that in, I guess, in the, yeah. in the prep work? Mm -hmm. How do you communicate your ideas? Yeah, yeah. It's like, it's, it's, it's a lot of references and making sure that you're actually speaking the same language. Because it's like sometimes you think you are. Yeah. But you're just so hung up on what you think it is, and the other person, and you're like, "Oh, how's it actually going to look?" So then, references are very important, and stuff like I don't think Shot Deck was around, or maybe it was actually, but you know, like pulling up references and watching stuff together to make sure we're actually talking about the same thing. Um, and um, for him, he he came up with the concept that like in the in the in the contemporary storyline, the shots are wider, and then in the flashback storyline, which is like concurrent. Mm -hmm. Um, that everything's like just tighter and longer lenses and stuff. So um, I really wanted to use anamorphics because I just wanted more. I just wanted to shoot with them more. I was really enamored with them from commercials, mm -hmm. but I hadn't had a chance to do like a long form scripted project with them yet. So so then I was like, okay, maybe it's anamorphic and spherical. Now in retrospect, I'm like, oh, maybe we could have gone even wider, like and further with that differentiation. But but I also think it's okay if some of those things are sort of subliminal for the viewer you know yeah. um so because that came from his initial idea was like fisheye sphericals on the present day and then like telephoto whatever so longer lenses on the past so this is just like riffing off that initial right. idea so, so the, the flashbacks are are a spherical yeah oh cool yeah and yeah. They, they tend to be like 50 mil plus yeah yeah but um really only if you're like someone looking at who looks at bokeh and stuff would yeah. you really Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. I didn't. No, I did notice the anamorphic, but and and I did notice that the flashbacks had a different texture to them. Obviously, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, not only like the warmer tones and all yeah. that, but but yeah, I didn't. I didn't notice that they were. There yeah, was like that change. Yeah, there's like a shift there, but um, but also we used Cook anamorphics, which are actually pretty subtle. They don't they don't like bend and distort as much as some other sets out there do. So, um. Which yeah, like it's it's it was sort of meant to be like an almost unconscious shift, but um, yeah, so that that was sort of what we landed on. But um, we also used um, live grading with our DIT Catherine mm -hmm. Pantazopoulos. and she so she and she was really invested in the color and just really in on it with Charles and I, me and Charles and Catherine were just like constantly talking on at the set monitors, or... yeah, on set, yeah. Oh wow. Because we kept live grade on, yeah. So we had a base LUT, and then but she could always tweak colors with us. So it was a, like the color conversation that starts in prep. It, it can really go further on set, you know, like if if you have those tools. Yeah. Um, and and then that in combination with like lighting with a you know a, a with like a board operator where you can tweak colors if you're using LED a lot. And it becomes this like big collaboration with everyone about getting the colors right and stuff. So it's nice. cool. Yeah, All it's right. fun. So let's yeah. take a look at some some of this stuff. Music down. Tell me what you smell. Mango? <laughs> I had a little taste this was a big conversation here about how to make this look like a real weed farm. Yeah, weed farm. Yeah. So, you know, it's always a collab between production designers. What kind of bulbs are going going to go in there? Uh, Blaine, again, was the gaffer on this. And, uh, you know, what kind of bulbs can we put in these industrial fixtures that we can have control over? And this was we didn't have Nick's bulbs, but, you know, like. Yeah, just making sure that it was going to be something compatible with what we would need it to be. Because I, I like to leave a lot of those variables up to set, to being on set, mm -hmm. like light levels and stuff. I really like being able to tweak that stuff once you're actually shooting, right? Because yeah. it's like the blocking could change. You don't. I just don't like painting people into a very specific scenario when it comes to lighting ratios and stuff. It's just sort of like an overall vibe that we design and then we can work work it out together on set. So so the the lights that are hitting their faces are just the, those pictures? Yeah, this one was very much like that, yeah. Wow. So I guess this this is where you can actually say that you only use the practicals? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. Nice. Those nice. white tables help, you know? To yeah. To and that low-lying fixture, too. We waited for a long time to install that thing. I remember it was one of those things where it was like, that one that's behind. Wow. Uh, but, you know... I really in retrospect, maybe it could have been done the day before. It's okay. Yeah. yeah and I mean, you live and you learn. Yeah. But I, I really like the wides that you do from such different angles. 
Then mm, you have one here, mm-hmm. and then you're looking in a different direction here. Yeah, maybe that's something I learned from TV shooting, which. I don't like to shoot a movie the way you shoot TV Mm -hmm. or one shoots or I shoot TV because there's just different requirements. But to give people a variety of things to look at on such a dialogue heavy scene is, I think, pretty valuable. Yeah. Like, oh, and also their angles, like you're looking Mm -hmm. at him from that perspective and then from this perspective. I know. That was one where I was like, oh, no, we need need something more about the weed, you know? So Charles (laughs) and I walked around with our things and two cameras would have been actually really good on this day, but. You know, they, they do it a few times and that's all good. But that that's one of the ones that we, we almost maybe could have missed that. I think it's really important to always think about like, okay, if you have like a little bit of extra time, is there one other angle, you know? Because yeah. the scene can escalate, then it has its own arc. For sure. Yeah. All right, let's move on to my two favorite flashbacks from the whole movie. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for watching these. No, I mean, appreciate it's, it. It's really cool. I, uh, Thank you. I really enjoyed it. What? Só que a tipo assim, mamã. Ma. What happened? Why do you stay with him? We need to leave, mom. I'll get the money. And we'll go together. Please. This is all in studio. This is, um, we went with, um, this, like, um, those Storaro gels. Okay. Like, uh, the DP Storaro has, like, a line of gels that are very punchy colors. So this was the one we settled on for any kind of amber light. It was, and then I think, it, and then I think we added like a, or it was a straw, I think, from that line. So yeah, it's just it's just like a flat with a brick wall outside. Right. Yeah. And you, did you just use the light from the from the windows to? For yeah, the it's just like a. It, it was just like a tungsten fresnel coming through. Yeah. Right. And then, um, what did we do? I think that it was just a combo of like bouncing some of it back. It, this one I know for sure we didn't add a lot in between for close-ups because the the vibe on set was to keep it very contained. This yeah. was one that was really important to Charles' this scene and he would come in, he would just like whisper direction and stuff and the camera was just like on my lap basically and it was, I just picked up on it. It's like, okay, don't, don't start up the whole machine in between takes on this one, you know? Sure. So we just, we were doing really minor stuff. But I mean, that, that skip looks, on looks the beautiful. Floor. I mean, Thank that you. white is is amazing. Thank you. I guess you just brought up the levels, right? Like in, in the close-ups. Yeah, I think we would have just probably bounced something back for her from that yeah. same source, you know? Mm-hmm. There's That's a couple, okay. though, you can see through the window. So, like, what I like to do is just, like, provide us with enough lights placed that it requires only very minor tweaks, yeah, just you know? Yeah, on and off kind of Yeah, on and, and off, or just twist it a little and bounce it. Yeah, yeah, so everything's basically where it needs to be. You don't have to actually move things around that much. Yeah. That's, that's the ideal. That's convenient. But, and yeah, I mean, it's such an emotional scene that you don't want to be meddling around too exactly, much. Exactly, yeah. You just want to be changing lenses, basically. That's yeah. it. That's awesome. And the prosthetics are so good, too. Yeah, and I now that, I, now that you mentioned it, I do notice now that these are spherical, and it does give, like, that mm-hmm. more, I guess safer childhood vibe but yeah it, it's like contrasting with the, the whole situation right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and then this other flashback oh yeah another one with a mother Ma. yeah this shot here to, worked out it was a very small set but you know there's like funny little moments oh. to just give it a little more scope you know just a few doorways and stuff that's cool. I mean, that's, that's that's all it needs in studio too. Yeah, just in studio. Yeah, nice. so it's like how to give it a little bit more um, reality to the world. Yeah, it's just like I, I really like how he comes from light to dark, yeah, from light to light again. Yeah, and a lot of these are just like single source through the through the window. Yeah, just like let let the light even be there. If that shear wasn't there, you'd probably see it. You know, just like take the barn doors off. Yeah, you don't need much to. Yeah. And I guess you are you bouncing something back. I think there must have been like a seal, probably just like a, uh, or maybe like a muzz bounce inside the room, like opposite direction. Mm-hmm. 
um, like on the wall maybe, you know, just like tape some muzz up and bounce something in there for a bit of fill or even just bouncing back what was already outside. Interesting. Nice. Yeah. And then it, has, it had to be the final scene, like the, the <laughs> yeah. climax. So many conversations about this. So we ended up building the con container set on yeah. the, in the back of the studio. Wow. Which ended up being cheaper than renting like an existing one. And the thing with the existing ones is they're constantly changing the configuration, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. it had to be such a specific configuration. So, um, and then Blaine had this great idea to use these um, industrial lights from uh, another gaffer, Laureen Ruddick. Those practicals that you see on the corner, Yeah, up right? top, because they're just magnetic. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Come on, let's go. And those weren't, controllable it's just like you get what you get but knowing mm -hmm. about this, this these smoke flares um that were going to be going off it worked out so nicely definitely and there's one large light on a lift um to just give the whole place like a general like a base level yeah uh that probably was like an 18k uh tungsten up very high very far away that's kind of giving that harder cut there you know just stuff like that right 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 that's really cool yeah it's cool this a lot of this stuff was written into the script so was it written to because as you as this scene progresses mm -hmm. you, I mean you kind of see like it's done right like the sun yes. starts coming in because we were behind on our schedule oh really yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know it kind of works yeah I mean the, the, the final shot of the scene when you can yeah. actually see the sun and it's yeah then down that here. worked oh out so cool I love that I was like yes and that was my um, my friend Brent Robinson was the steady cam operator and he knows how to like embrace the beauty yeah. the beautiful stuff like that and to just just to pick the moments, right? Because he picked that perfect moment to let it come up and into the shot. I was like, yes, just as those, well, no spoilers, maybe we'll watch it. But <laughs> but this kind of stuff I had nightmares about until we got into the final grade because I was like, it was way too blue. But, you know, it's it's, it's okay. Like it's... Um, I mean, it's, it's color and, contrast. You can... You... Yeah. And sun rises quickly when it rises. So yeah. but it's, the way it's... the editor put it together worked out. No, perfectly. And in... in it does kind of give it a sense of progression like mm -hmm. it's yeah because the whole film takes place over one night anyway so it actually like yeah. it, i mean it, it adds tension yeah so it, everything was supposed to be dark yeah in the beginning yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh wow and actually the sun wasn't supposed to rise till they're in the car that's oh, okay. when the sun was supposed to rise I, i'm with you I, i'm happy it worked out this way actually because it's uh, there, it's something there's something more tragic about this happening at dawn definitely it's yeah. uh i mean it's a, it's death but mm -hmm. it, it's a, the, the dawn of a new day yeah it it definitely says things here comes brent's magic moment that is a there. beautiful shot He's, yeah spectacular Whew. you know one of those ones where it's like and look at his performance yeah i love that that's what i love i love the, those moments in filmmaking yeah definitely that was amazing Thank you. All right. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. All right. I'd just like to maybe wrap up with a, a few more questions, if you don't mind. Of course. Um, when it comes to, I guess not only working on set, but navigating the industry as a, as a filmmaker, as a, as a cinematographer, do you have any do's and don'ts or or any advice for people mm. that want to pursue this? As yeah, a I'd say. Um, as much as you can, I know there's other factors at play and you got to, you know, just keep flexing the muscle. But as much as you can to just really try to work on stuff you can really stand behind, like whether that's like emotionally or politically and with people you trust. Um, I think there's so much kind of chasing after what looks good on a resume or on a reel and stuff. And But if it's not the right fit for you, it can really like turn you off from the whole pursuit of it, you know, if it's a bad experience or something like that. So I think that that to me, though, 
older I get, it's something I was lucky enough to do for a long time. And but sometimes there's a misstep and, and it can be kind of crushing. So, you know, like I think that's something that I really am trying to protect as much as I can all the time. And what I think would um, be my advice to anyone who's really trying to continue loving this thing because it's it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of your energy and it's a big commitment so if you're not really loving the stuff you're spending all that time on it can start to wear on your spirit a bit I think but beyond that you know if if you're feeling good about the stuff that's that's out there to shoot um uh, I don't know I'm just a big believer in like playing around with different genres and stuff too and anything that you think there's something fun to learn something new from even if it's not like the dream project you thought you wanted next, like it's always really worth doing those, especially if it was something you never considered, you know, yeah. like I never considered doing TV, but I learned so much from doing TV. It's, it's, and it's a great, um, it's just a really great way to have fun and stay involved and invested in the craft. Um, so I'd say just, just be open to any kind of invitation or genre or, other type of new way to use the camera that you didn't expect. Yeah. Those are the, those are the two things I would say. Nice. Cool. And uh, in terms for, for, for you, what's next for you? What are you working on? Are you mm. cooking anything up for 2023? So I just finished shooting on a Star Trek Discovery, which was oh, wow. really fun. Yeah. So I, I was really, really uh, loving that and loved the VR wall a lot. Wow. It was Look really fun. Yeah, I like the volume. That's awesome. It's tricky, but I think it's the future for sure. Yeah. And so I feel very lucky to have like played around with that a bunch. Um, so that was fun. Uh, we just finished that. And then uh, and I'm, I'm starting a new film now that's sort of like a also sci-fi, but a much more philosophical kind of mm -hmm. sci-fi that's grounded. So it's not it's less emphasis on like effects and stuff yeah. and more like of that. a psychological thing. Like yeah. That. Yeah. So that'll be cool. That's a that, and that's a feature film. Nice. Yeah. So that that's what's that's what I'm doing like in the immediate future. So nice. that'll be fun. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. So just to end, uh, I like to end with a little fun section of quick questions that mm -hmm. I call run and gun. Oh yeah. Okay. So it's like <laughs> run and gun. literally that's a good one. any like the first thing that comes to your mind. You don't have to yeah. think about it too much. Okay. Uh, so right, you ready? Yeah. Cool. Um, if it wasn't cinematography, what other department would you be doing? Post sound. Okay. And what other, what other job if it wasn't film? High school, high school teacher. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay. Um, light meter or full color or eyeballing? Ooh, I, I pop false color and, and waveform on all the time. I don't use my light meter anymore. Okay. It's all just right. true. Handheld or sticks? Hmm. Handheld, probably. Mm -hmm. Handheld or dolly? Dolly. Dolly or motion control? Still dolly. All right, cool. Yeah. Wide angle or telephoto? Ooh, these days wide angle. Mm -hmm. Nice. Anamorphic or spherical? Anamorphic. HMI or tungsten? Tungsten. Tungsten or LED? LED. LED or the sun? The sun. <laughs> nice. It's <laughs> a great question. <laughs> uh, do you like? Do you prefer lighting people or lighting spaces? People. All right. One camera or two cameras? Uh, there's pros and cons to both. I like to say one camera. But two is always nice to have in your back pocket. So yeah, okay, <laughs> fair. I don't know. <laughs> Series or feature film? Feature film. All right. Do you have a favorite gel? Hmm. Yeah, maybe maybe straw. Straw, mm -hmm. nice. Uh, favorite diffusion? Hmm. Magic, magic cloth. Magic cloth. Mm -hmm. All right. And Opal, Opal all the time is like a given, but Magic Cloth's a nice, nice. nicer and one. And yeah. is there any director that you would like to work with? Whew. There's many, let me think. Probably Kelly Reichard. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Awesome. Well, nice, thank you so nice much. Nice running gun questions. Yeah, <laughs> thanks, Pancho. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was great. Uh, really appreciate you coming out and, thank you. Appreciate and sharing you. your knowledge. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to talk to you. And thanks for checking out the Canadian film scene. Yeah. It's uh, these movies. Starting to be a part of it. So of course. It's it's cool to to talk to you and to watch these yeah. films. Yeah, I'm glad you're here. Thanks. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> cool.
that was awesome. 